Hello and welcome to Comic Book Herald's Hick Mania, a series running through 2022 where we'll be reading and analyzing the creator-owned works of writer Jonathan Hickman from his debut, The Nightly News, through to his most recent output. I'm debut sync founder and editor-in-chief of ComicBookHerald.com. I'm really excited to be launching this project. It's something I've been meaning to do for a while now, probably since House of X and Powers of Ten sort of reinvigorated, I think, my fandom around Jonathan Hickman as a comic book creator. Um, I've definitely wanted to go and revisit and, and reanalyze and rediscuss much of his creator own work. Uh, and, and now we have a window to do this. So, you know, I'll put up kind of a reading plan that everybody can find in the show notes. Um, if you follow Compa Carol, I'll be trying to post it other places as well. But, you know, basically the, the idea here is we're going to work chronologically through Jonathan Hickman's creator owned output. Um, and I think if this goes well here in 2022, you know, it's, it's something that I think I'll probably want to continue doing um with with other creators going into 2023 so get your votes in let me know in comments on twitter on youtube uh what other creators you would potentially like to see a project like this for also give me your puns right give me your puns because hickmania was easy um i don't know that i have as many for like brian k vaughn for example <laughs> um i think getting getting brew baked with ed brubaker has certain connotations so we're gonna we're gonna need to keep working on those um but today I'm very excited to be joined by Zach Quaintance. Zach is the uh, founder, editor-in-chief of Comics Bookcase, a comic book writer in his own right with uh, Next Door, which you kickstarted not so long ago. Uh, so, Zach, I'm definitely going to want your perspective here on what it's like to debut a comic and and how uh, somewhat easy Hickman makes it look here. So, Zach, thank you for joining. How are you doing today? I'm good, Dave. Thanks for thanks for having me. Excited to uh, to dig into this. Yeah, same, same. So the nightly news is a uh, it's a graphic novel. It's six issues, six issue minis that launched in 2006. It runs from 2006 to 2007. So we're at kind of the 15 year anniversary of when this work came out. And it was Jonathan Hickman's first published like comic book work. Uh, he had done some short stuff like he had competed in uh, what was at the time called comic book resources, um, comic book idol which was basically, you know, like like it sounds like an American Idol type thing for comics creators. He finished second in that, so he got some publicity. But as a creator, you know, we think of in 2021, Jonathan Hickman is one of kind of the biggest names in in modern American mainstream comics, right? Like I, I was thinking about this, like who's on Hickman's level over the past 15 years? You got like Ed Brubaker, you got Robert Kirkman. Um, Scott Snyder, maybe Jeff Lemire, Grant Morrison continues to be certainly, um, and maybe a Bendis, you know, Matt Fraction, right. For a time, Rick Remender, there aren't that many names. Um, there are not that many names that, that kind of have the level of consistency, the level of fandom and the level of celebration, but it all starts here in 2006, in 2006, rather with the nightly news, which is an incredibly fully formed debut, um, of a graphic novel, you know, and, and the thing that is so wild about the nightly news is Hickman writes, he draws, he colors, he designs, he edits, which may maybe an editor wouldn't have been the worst thing <laughs> on the nightly news. Uh, but he does everything. He does absolutely everything. And, and on that level, it's definitely very interesting. So what we're going to do today is we're going to talk about the content of the nightly news. Uh, we're going to talk about um, questions we have, kind of how it fits into the bibliography. Um, you know, what works, what doesn't looking back again, especially for this one, 15 years later, you know, and I think something like the nightly news, which talks so much about where news media was at in 2006, like a lot has changed in 15 years. A lot hasn't right. We're going to, we're going to touch on those things. Um, if you're playing along here in Hickmania, again, I'm going to include all the comics we're reading in the show notes. I would love for you to read along with us. Um, that's kind of the goal. That's the purpose is kind of a reading club where then we get to have a fun conversation about things. Uh, spoilers will follow. Okay. So definitely anticipate that we were going to talk about this work in detail and um and kind of the career of this writer as well okay so zach here's a quote from from hickman okay and i've been reading a bunch of interviews i'll include links to these in the show notes as well because they're pretty interesting going back in time you can kind of pull some of these from like archive.org hickman tells uh andy Corey in a really good interview on cbr that aired, aired in uh, 2007 i was going to quit being an advertising guy so hickman's coming out of the world of advertising the world of graphic design comics are what i always wanted to do I was 33 years old and I decided I want to have my first book out by the time I was 35. That's the, that's the setup for the nightly news. Zach, as a comic book debut, um, how, how do you think the nightly news functions? And, you know, as someone who has put together a comic yourself, not that long ago, 
like is it a miracle <laughs> that it's this tight you know like what, what what do you think of all that um well first thing kind of looking reflecting back through my own experiences i'm a little jealous he's able to do uh everything himself <laughs> mm -hmm. because i think one of the most uh challenging and um I guess tough to estimate experiences of putting together a debut comic is just the amount of coordination you you need to do if it's if you're sort of the one leading the show. Uh, so from that from that angle, like I think that's a real like uh, uh, mark in his favor of like juggle not having to juggle coordinating different people, um, yeah. which plays into the other strength of the book to me, which was, I thought it, it like his voice is there, like in, mm -hmm. in this book throughout kind of shaping everything. Uh, it's, it's a very singular, it feels like a very singular, uh, vision, um, uh, for, for any sort of comic, let alone a, a debut, which I think makes it especially impressive. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, sort of confidence with his voice that comes across here is definitely one of the standouts. I mean, it feels like a Jonathan Hickman work. If you've read any of his stuff over the last 15 years, you know, he, he kind of does have that. I think the difference is, you know, if you, if you are maybe most familiar with Hickman's Marvel work, which I think a lot of readers certainly are, um, whether you came in through X-Men most recently, um, whether you were there for Fantastic Four and Avengers right on through Secret Wars, there's an anger and uh, violence to the nightly news that is very uh, outside of what we've come to know in his Marvel work, I think, in a lot of ways. Um, there's a a cynicism and and a, a smarminess, you know, humor. The smarminess, actually, I think, is carried through. But, um, but certainly there's a very cynical, angry outlook at the world, uh, and, and it's pretty politically charged. Um, I think Hickman likes to, in interviews at this time, and, and even now, he likes to step outside of that he definitely as a storyteller I, I i've gathered does not buy into the sort of like this is not his mouthpiece for his views necessarily this is him playing both sides and and showing how it kind of works and i so like just to kind of frame that too with the nightly news i mean the the plot here is there is an organization here called the voice okay and they have all they're made up of individuals who have been spurned by corporate news media. Um, they have had their lives ruined almost to a T by reporting that was wrong, right? They got accused of something, um, or they got outed for, you know, like financial ruin or for committing some crime that they didn't do. And because it was out in the media, their lives were ruined. Um, you know, these they got things wrong and, and mistakes were made and and they weren't corrected. So these all these individuals all have this anger towards big corporate news media and this cult of the voice. And we're going to continue to talk about how it is a cult. Um, they engage in basically murder activism against the news media. Um, they literally their mission is to wipe out and kill as many journalists, as many people in the press as possible. Um that is the plot. <laughs> That's it, basically, of the nightly news. And I think as a story, the nightly news is not especially impressive. Um, it feels to me a lot like the inspirations of Fight Club and sort of the ethos of sticking it to the man and and violently, you know, insurrecting against corporations and, and thought control and those sorts of things. What makes the nightly news kind of fascinating and and I think really elevated it to best of the year status and and you know Hickman as this kind of up and rising creator um is the design I mean it's it's the visuals it's the way this book looks um it's the it's the graphic design elements that he's bringing into the work and the infographics and stuff I don't Zach I'll pause there like do you agree <laughs> with that sentiment so yeah um I took some notes kind of while going back over this one and and one of the ones close to the top of the list is this is an incredibly cynical comic from the ground up and it mm -hmm. sort of permeates everything about it like there's um there's almost a an assumption that everyone uh that this book features is operating for the worst possible reasons like yeah. wh whether it be profiteering or um 
just sort of maliciously destroying people for power. Like there's never, there's not a single instance of, I don't think, unless uh, I miss something of a character in this book doing anything for the the right reasons. Like, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so yeah, it, it's incredibly cynical. And um, I, I do agree with you that, that like what, what really makes it stand out is the way it kind of deploys um, design uh, in, I think what, what, you could almost call still non-conventional ways for comic book storytelling, but it certainly must have felt like, like uh, something that, that had never been seen before back in 2006, 2007. Like, yeah, uh, you, you could probably call it innovative uh, in the way it uses infographics with um, to kind of push along the se- sequential storytelling, which there's really not not too much of in in the traditional sense. Like, there's mm-hmm. not a lot of uh, scenes that you can read sequentially from start start to finish like it's there's a lot of abstractions and sort of ranting and um kind of uh research conveyed in different ways um but yeah (laughs) very cynical very angry and sort of a um uh some some choices i think that haven't haven't really aged super well like there's a lot of uh references to sexual assault which i found pretty pretty uncomfortable i think five of the six issues um mentioned rape in some context like none of which i found vital to the story really i mean i don't yeah so, yeah, yeah there, there, there's a sort of casually been... casually used uh language around that i think too is, the, is a big part of the problem yeah and kind of played um there's that thing about students uh, and teachers which is almost played as a bit like it, it definitely wasn't uh it was almost thrown in like as a joke almost which i found yeah, yeah. pretty uncomfortable um so there's a little bit of of rough edges i think i think you can kind of feel um him coming bitterly out of a different career into this one like sort of being like the gloves are off i can say and do whatever i want and like don't have to sanitize things the way one might uh most certainly in in an advertising career so i think there was a little bit of like pushing that as far uh as he could and like i don't know if it always like there's there's definitely a few instances more than a few instances where it doesn't doesn't quite work. Um, and I found a little distracting kind of reading through now. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I, I want to come back to that because I think the sanitizing of it, the editing of it and the things that in 2006, you could tell Hickman was playing for edginess. Um, I think now play very poorly. Uh, and I, I suspect, you know, a lot of readers would agree, frankly, um, if you've been along this journey, like a lot of his works wouldn't do these things now. Uh, I, I do want to kind of back up to it and just say like you know the clearest tell here that hickman is like leaving the world of advertising design to first off i think you're spot on that like it it has that feel of somebody who's like i am getting out of this world now and i'm doing the thing that he's so passionate about and the one one of the things i love so much about him as a creator but especially where he is you know coming into this book is like he just wants to make comics like he's so excited clearly there's such passion for doing comics his way. And and that part of it is very thrilling. That part of it's very fun. Um, But you can tell he's going from advertising to comics, again, because of the heavy use of infographics. Like these are, even at the time this is coming out in 2006, like almost a little dated. And this is something he admits in interviews. Like that's the point. Like they're supposed to be very familiar elements of charts and facts and figures that you would see presented on the news or in newspapers, right? Or in obviously in 2006, a burgeoning online scene. Um, and and he's capturing that intentionally, I think, both stylistically, because it's a book about the news, and it makes sense. But also that allows him to do this thing that has clearly been a huge part of his comics career, which is the integration of information presented as straight information is graphic design information within sequential art. Like there are not too many comics that had done this, I think, as thoroughly. And it's been such a big part of his career. Obviously, with X-Men, the thing that, that readers would be most familiar with right now is like what's, you know, we talk about as data pages, right? These pages of literal text that feel kind of mind-blowing for an X-Men comic, but are the most traditional way to present information in terms of like the history of newspapers right and stuff like that so that's what he's bringing to this it definitely stands out it is interesting um he also like he has an awareness he has a meta awareness which is here in the comic with all these little asides written in the in the margins um of the fact that this is not 
what sequential art often means to people. So he has these little asides when he presents a chart and he's like, hey, you could read about the effects of Ritalin on children or you could just, if you don't really care and you just want to be entertained, you could skip ahead like I would, right? And it's smarmy and it's cynical, um, but it's also like a meta-awareness that at times um, I enjoy. Sometimes, I don't know, like the, the caveats he puts at the front of each issue where he's like, I don't endorse this violence, clearly anticipating some backlash for like, oh, this guy wants to murder journalists. Um, he's got a he's got a jokiness to them. Uh, but there's times where I'm like, well, you're kind of you're kind of still having your cake and eating it too, um, in doing that. And I'm I'm not sure you're you're as you're not as culpable as you think just because you made a joke about it. Uh, but all right, so the the piece that you touched on that's really really major, I think, is nightly news plays as both prescient and more than a little grotesque. Um, you know, the, the scopes are set on corporate news media. Again, you have this cult of the voice. There's a very literalized parallel of a cult and the way that cults work. So like our, the main character, and this is not a character driven story at all, um, is this John Guyton individual who I'm pretty sure is like artistically is just like Photoshop Jonathan Hickman. <laughs> yeah. His <laughs> like name's John and he looks exactly like Jonathan Hickman. Like <laughs> yeah. it's pretty thinly veiled uh self uh inclusion. <laughs> right, right. Um so so John Guyton is kind of he's brought into the cult of the voice and and they're going to, you know, do violence against against all of journalism um because of the mistakes they make, the way money and institutions shape what they present. Um, how they stoke a culture of, of brainwashed hostility, right? A lot of those arguments are certainly still relevant, I think, although certain aspects have changed tremendously in 15 years, right? But like the focus on the media as a big bad. Um, oh, and actually, I guess just to connect the dots. So like the parallel there, the mirror that I'm saying is there's the cult of the voice. And then what Hickman's also telling us is there's the cult of news of watching news media, right? So like he's saying both of these parties here are brainwashed, basically. Like, like everyone in a cult, as you'd expect, is like they can't have sex. They control what food they eat. Um, they, they wear all the same outfits all every day, right? They are literally in a cult. But he's saying the mirror of that is all of us being fed the corporate news media, and they are basically turning us into a cult of following whatever binary is, is easiest for them, right? Whether it's a political ideology, whatever, right? So that that's the mirror, I think, that is here. Um, again, the focus on the media is a big bad has never been more relevant since the Trump era, like clearly this is a huge, huge thing in 2021 um, or in 2022 when this is coming out and the threat of violence against this perceived enemy like has never been more real. So that's the piece of it of the nightly news that I was the most worried about coming back to. That would be like 15 years later, this reads scarier because it's happening because it's really there. And a lot of people, you know, I could see the nightly news functioning as like, well, they're not reading it as satire. They're reading it as a manifesto. Um, Zach, what do you think about the way that it's kind of connected to where we are today and just that that uncomfortableness of of the relevance of it, I suppose? So, yeah, I had <clears throat> the notes I kind of took. Uh, there were I had two main thoughts around that around that point. Um, the first one is it is it is difficult, like uh, the way media has sort of been villainized uh, in, in extremist circles makes that makes a comic about murdering them. Uh read differently i think than it probably did upon release like it's yeah. it's i don't think it was intended to 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 feel uh, like you said like a borderline like it could be read as a borderline manifesto and that's a little uncomfortable like that's um and then it, that kind of the other point i had there around is this like and i don't know like it's not really a knock on on the creator here but there's a complete absence of social media mainly because i don't think it had quite been invented yet as we know it this is like early myspace ish you know in 2006 right like we're not even at yeah. facebook church maybe facebook's just kind of i guess let's see 2006 i was that's probably when i started a facebook account by the end of that year i'm guessing i i think it was in the stage where like it had to be brought to your school like i remember 2006 oh, yeah. specifically being the year where it was like oh our school is now on facebook and it was going sort of like from college to college yeah. Um, but it had no involvement and neither did MySpace with any sort of traditional news media. Like it was it was a function for customizing your personal profile. Like that was what you used it for. Like here's yeah. some pictures of me and my friends, basically. Um yeah, right. and so it's like I, I kind of struggled to like evaluate the uh the message um in in this comic 
in a modern context, just because that's such a big piece of the way media runs, like YouTube channels, uh, right. Twitter, all, all these things, which are absolutely kind of the, almost become the foundation of the way um, a, a large portion of the country consumes media is just completely not a factor uh, in this book. And it plays out in different ways. Like there's an idea in this comic that um, news corporations are sort of all powerful and entirely in control. And there's yeah, also right. like sort of, a, uh, this is pre-recession as well, when a lot of news corporations really were kind of gutted um, and a lot of buyouts and layoffs, especially in print media, uh, would come shortly after this comic. So it's kind of it's kind of difficult in some ways to evaluate what it's trying to say and why with our current media landscape. Like it doesn't, it's yeah. not entirely an easy fit just because it's missing some of these giant pieces that were to come almost uh, immediately after the publication of these comics. Yeah, it's definitely, it is of the era and of the time of publication in a way that I don't think anyone could have anticipated. And in a way that like you could not make the nightly news now um, at all without it being seen as an extremely messed up book. <laughs> like, yeah. Like yeah. You just couldn't. Um, and I, and I think, yeah, you're spot on like the way that, the thing with the news, like that's the piece that I probably connect to the least is in Hickman's view in 2006, the corporate owned news media has such tremendous influence and power. And I think there's still relevance to that. But like you're saying, Zach, it's now so fragmented and its information is split so, um, so like widely across sources that where to me, actually the news, like, cause there's a, there's a, one of the things that Hickman gets at that I think connects with a lot of people, regardless of your political leanings, is like the trustworthiness of news is compromised by corporate profit motivations, right? Like that's that's one of the bigger messages and kind of angry things he's getting across here is like, well, news is they're less interested in reporting the facts and they're more interested in making money. And whether that's that's not necessarily the fault of the individual journalists, but they're a piece of this machinery that is driven by money. And I think if there's one theme you take away from Hickmania and reading these works from a certain point of view, it's follow the money, right? I think mm -hmm, a lot definitely. of his greater own works, especially Black Monday Murders, right, once we get there, is like, and, and even like X-Men, look at X-Men number four, where they're having the, the conference in Davos, Switzerland, you know, and they're having this conversation about how money drives everything. It drives influence. It drives power. Like that's that's the message he's getting across. And he's trying to just sort of sell like it's really messed up. Like these things that we take for granted, like the facts of the news, you know, are manipulated and, and are influenced by, you know, individuals looking out for their own power and how power corrupts. Right. Another theme of his work. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. You want to jump in? Yeah. And I think what what this book supposes often is that that that's the fault of corporations almost entirely. But what yeah. we've seen in the last uh, decade has been an influx of citizen journalists empowered by podcasts and YouTube, who it turns out are just as uh, motivated by money and like mm. kind of play even looser with facts and reality than kind of corporate media, which has uh, a little a semblance of, of accountability, whereas somebody like Alex Jones is just like making things up whole. So like, yeah, yeah. so it kind of like, it doesn't, this book doesn't offer a lot of answers. Like it, it offers more kind of a list of grievances than like, but there does seem to be an undercurrent of, um, of, of like, oh, what if we could just get like, uh, diff, like a different way to report the news. And we've kind of seen that happen, like free of these mm -hmm. corporate shackles. And it turns out it's like maybe a little worse, like depending like, <laughs> yeah. on the individual. And I think part of that reason is is um the responsibility of us as news consumers like there if people are willing to seek out like unhinged totally made up podcasts and kind of uh live with them as their main news source like they're going to exist and they're going to, to profiteer off that and um so that that's another kind of like recent development i thought that kind of like i couldn't that was like kind of playing heavily heavily on the way i was like interpreting um some of this like i was kind of found myself thinking well you know, we've seen it done a little bit differently and like it, it's not like it's not as simple as just um, these corporate holdings are the bad guys. And if we got rid of them, everything would be fine. Turns out it's, it's not like you can open it up to other people and you're going to have a lot of the same problems as long if you don't have like a media literate 
educated consumership. Yeah, yeah, right. Um, and and Hickman, I think he, he's playing with those ideas. I think you know one of his skills, which maybe is it's on display here, but because it's not quite refined enough, it plays you know troublingly now. Is he is very good at getting in the mindset of whatever characters, whatever parties he's portraying, right? And I think a lot of times with with authorship, there's a mistake that readers make, and I make this too, where you're like, oh, well, that's what they believe. Right. Um, and and I think, you know, I think the the reality is like, no, he's just a really convincing liar, as he would say, because he's telling a story, right? And he he wants he wants you to follow the cult of of media hatred here as almost protagonists, even though they're clearly not, right? It's kind of that thing of like Alan Moore, Dave Gibbons, John Higgins, Rorschach, and Watchmen, right? Where it's like so many readers, and I had this experience as a young man reading it the first time, are like, Rorschach's the effing coolest. Like, yeah, I love right. this character. Right. And then and then the reality is you kind of read more and you come to understand, you read some interviews with more. It's like, oh, well, no, like there's that there's a, um, a sarcasm to the way Moore is writing him. Um, that is not something to be idealized <laughs> and, and held up as the standard. And I think that's, that's ultimately, I think when you, when you, when I read the nightly news now and having followed a fair amount of Hickman's work, like when he says something like early on, he's talking about how the voice is going to take out journalists. And he's like, you know, you have activists are the first people they murder, right? You have these activists protesting. So they're like, they're just shooting protesters, right? And there's, there's violence and there's a grossness to that that is really uncomfortable. Um, but here's a quote from the book. They want change, but offer nothing of consequence, nothing of significance, nothing of remembrance, nothing to cause real change. And like, it is a call for violence, right? And he is selling it. And there's that really difficult line to blend here of, is he, again, just a really convincing liar in service of a story? Or is he selling something that is dangerous? <laughs> and and scary, I think, in some ways, you know, and that's, I think he would say that's the point of the story. Um, but certainly reading it 15 years later, when we see this stuff happening, it's like, oh, that that hurts a little bit, you know? Yeah. And I think there's actually an instance where the facade drops a little bit. Like, I, I can't remember exactly where it happens in the book, but there is a point where somebody's like, you people aren't heroes. You're just like violent murderers, like yes. unhinged violent murderers. I think it's like about midway through where it's kind of like uh, they, he does let that kind of peek through that. Like, look, I know these guys are the center of the story, but they're not heroes. <laughs> like mm -hmm. that's that's mm -hmm. in there. And I think it's I think it's in the conversation. So, John, and we're not doing a heck of a lot of plot which I don't intend to be like, I don't necessarily want to just read you the story, but so John, this main individual who's brought into the voice and is, is brainwashed into the cult of it. Um, he gets kind of taken out of it at one point by a therapist and, and through this journalist who's trying to go undercover and sort of expo expose the voice. And, um, I think the therapist kind of offers that middle ground voice. That is probably the most familiar to me as a reader here where where they're essentially voicing like, yeah, kind of what you just said, Zach, like, okay, you're, you're, Hey, like you recognize you're in a cult now. Like that's kind of infuriating. Right. Cause they don't, they don't necessarily see that at first. Um, but then also just like kind of voicing that, like, yeah, a lot of us have problems with the news media. That doesn't mean murder's okay. <laughs> right. And like that being kind of a relevant, important lesson. Um, so that, that stuff is in here. I think when you take the work in its entirety, certainly that is a piece of it. Um, but again, it's just it's the anger of it. It's it's the anger of the way the world works, the way information is presented, the way, you know, society is so fragmented. Um, and that's it's an anger that hasn't I don't know that the themes have have dried up as much as as definitely the anger in Hickman's work has. And and I think in interviews after this, he definitely says, like, I'm not that angry of a person. <laughs> like, yeah, you know, like I, and again, it's that thing of like applying authorial intent is is, you know, a fool's game. Right. Like, I don't. I don't know his his head and his heart, um, but just taking what's on the page, certainly it reads reads angrily and um, and and cynically. So, all right. So, one thing I wanted to ask you is, so the nightly news, you know, we talk about sort of the the messages, I think, and the the ways that they're just really muddled. I think when you when you factor in, you know, like Hickman was prescient in terms of thinking like these are problems. I think he was not Nostradamus in terms of being like. And that's, he, you know, his his take, his prediction is like, OK, like five major corporations own all of news media or whatever. That number is going to shrink. And like, while that's kind of true, basically, to your point, it's like, yeah, but this spread of misinformation, the way news gets out there is totally different um, in a way that I, I don't think he anticipates here. Uh, let's let's talk a little bit about more just as a graphic novel, as as a comics work. 
um, artistically. I think Hickman, so again, like this is, we think of Hickman the writer today. Here he's drawing, he's coloring, he's lettering everything. I think artistically his work lacks motion and, and fluidity. Um, probably he would, he would admit as much. Um, it's, it's, it's very photorealistic and sort of photoshopped elements kind of copied and pasted into really interesting use of concentric circles and an infographics and graphic design that is atypical for a comics page. Um, he covers for it. You know, there's frequently a fun sense of exploration with what you can do in the medium, right? The little author asides commenting on what you're reading in the margins. Uh, Zach, how do you, how do you like this? How do you think it reads um, design wise artistically? So I, I found it really interesting and I, I found it kind of hard to think about uh, a lot of the design choices he made without sort of um, thinking about how effective it's become in his work as he's kind of evolved as a creator. Yeah. Um, like your mileage might might vary on this, but I think like in, if you look at the the X Men line, they're all using those info pages. Uh, but Hickman is almost like like his his info pages and the way he uses them uh, to me are a lot more effective than like not to say anyone else uses them ineffectively, but but he's a, he's a pro at it, and you can kind of. When you when you read this comic, it's hard not to think like, oh, he's so good at this because he's been doing it for 15 years. Like this is right. almost this is like a uh, watching him kind of learn to walk with these things a little bit mm -hmm. and stumbling here and there. Like some of it, it's definitely not as as fine tuned as it as it is in his X Men work or in Black Monday Murders. Like he was he's really learn like developed from this point where it's, these are kind of like cheeky at times kind of maybe a little uh too prescriptive with with how much information is into these things and mm -hmm. and if you carry that line through to to black monday murders where he uses it sort of cryptically to set tone and ambience i think it's a really interesting journey like to see yeah. how he's evolved with this and how much better he's gotten at it and in in like there's some imitators out there now trying to catch up but he's just so far ahead of the rest of comics and the risk he's willing to take and what he's able to do with sort of design driven storytelling yeah um, so i thought that was really interesting throughout um if i'm evaluating it sort of like like how does it read in a vacuum it's kind of rough at times like it's not mm -hmm. it doesn't work always like it, and there's kind of a um like a feeling here and there of your like like waiting for the story to really start in some issues like and it yeah. just seems like oh here's more info here's more info here's more info like when are we going to get to the story at times like um so yeah those are kind of the two uh impressions like if you take it as sort of a a first steps in what's become a really effective comic storytelling tool it's really interesting but then at the same time i think it does there are rough edges to it um in the in the exact telling of, of this as like an independent graphic novel yeah, I would agree. I, so there's a quote here from that from that interview he does with Andy Corey. He says, with the layouts, that's really about there being three different layers of content. There are the two that you traditionally see in comics, which are speaking in very basic terms, the words and the pictures. And then I'm adding a third, which is kind of a visual subtext, bits of information that are tangential to the direct narrative, but really add texture to the story. And that really defines so much of what his career has been, right? And what has, I think, separated him from the herd in so many ways, like you said, from here on through X-Men and Black Money Murders and just everything he does. Um, maybe East to West plays less, honestly, uh, with like with infographics. That's probably the most that's probably the straightest fiction words and pictures book that you're going to find out there, even though design and use of white space and stuff is is pretty essential to the reading experience. Um, that's probably the work to me that that is the most just like, hey, here's a story. Um, but everything else is even X-Men, even even that stuff. Um, you know, it's it's obviously or like Secret Wars, I guess, right? Like that that doesn't have this. Uh, but anyway, like it's it's very much a part of what his career is supposed to be. And, and I think what he likes about being able to make comics is this, this ability to convey information. I think with the nightly news, there's a trap where that actually becomes like the point. Like right. that actually becomes the purpose is to be like, I'm mad as hell about all this stuff that's going on in the world. I want to share my list of recommended reading with you. Um, and he's, you know, pulling in infographics from other sources. Uh, it's not, you know, it's not like he's out here doing the research, right? Like he's pulling in infographics and he's sharing them. It, it's just the fact that he's sharing them in the medium of comics in a very Fight Club-esque story that I think made it feel very fresh and very unique and and not incorrectly, right? Not a lot of people are doing that. Um, I do think, you know, like his, he is open about his recommended reading list and the stuff that he's cribbing from here. Um, 
you got Seth Manukin, Hard News. You got Margaret Thaler Singer, Cults and Her Mist. It's a lot of books from 2004. <laughs> you know, so it's one of those things where it's <laughs> like, clearly that is, you know, he wrote this book in 2006, right? So it's like what he was reading then. Um, he he mentions, I think the issue that maybe is the the strangest, not the strangest, but just the one that I question the most is issue number three, which is the one that really gets into schools and, and the way that um, children are sort of brainwashed and on drugs on Ritalin as a rising thing. And he mentions at the end of that, he's like, I could not have done this without John Taylor Gatto's um, The Underground History of American Education, right? So he's really just taking like, it's a little book party, you know, if you want to be critical of it. Um, and, and that issue in particular is like, thematically, it connects to the idea of brainwashing and this idea that like, okay, our kids are, are brainwashed from, from a young age into these systems. But I don't think it works in the broader story, you know, because it it's really, it's disconnected. We don't have any kids in the story. We don't talk about how this impacts any of the, there, there's no character connection to this information. I don't know. I, that issue is, I think, visually very compelling and informationally compelling and relevant, but I, I don't know that it fits in the nightly news. What do you think? Yeah, no, I'm, I'm with you there. I think what we were talking about earlier with uh, not having an editor like that, that, that may be the clearest example of where another perspective might have helped out to kind of to be um because yeah. it's definitely something he found interesting and i i thought yes. the stuff about ritalin was kind of interesting but it it they don't come back to it and it doesn't like you could probably remove that that um all the ideas about the public schools and it and not lose anything from the mm -hmm. rest of the comic like it mm -hmm. just it reads uh it reads as a as kind of a out of nowhere screed against public education which which feels kind of, <laughs> kind of strange like yeah right like i i don't think it really got to like like you said like there's kernels of like okay this is kind of like there's brainwashing let's talk about brainwashing but it, it never really it only it kind of touches on that and by not really kind of um tying it to the rest of it it ends up being being pretty distracting and kind of, and a little strange I, I thought so too yeah for sure um okay so i think like very broadly, the nightly news has never been my favorite Hickman work. Certainly, I do think there's there's gonna be a gap in perception here, depending on when you engage with the material. You know, because it it is this is a book, I think, written for a young person's anger, right? Like it is, it's got a punk rock ethos. You can roll your eyes at that if you like, but it's definitely what it's going for. Um, and I think if you read this when you're 18, in your early 20s, there might be a sense of like, yeah, F all this stuff. Like, yeah, like the news media is corrupt. And and certainly that anger is, that's real, right? That's regardless of age, that stuff's real. Um, so I think for me, I'm definitely more skittish about it as I get older. I'm definitely more like I'm made uncomfortable by it, which is the point. Like that is, that is a lot of what he's trying to do is make you uncomfortable. Um, I think I'm... I'm less uncomfortable by the ideas, which feel now fairly well known and predictable and more uncomfortable about the casual use of, like you said, um, sexual assault and dialogue of of violence against, quote unquote, innocent people. And the idea that, well, they're in this profession, there are no innocent people like those are scary ideas to me in a I think you're letting that get away from you kind of concept as opposed to like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe. I can't believe news is driven by money. Like that's not, you know, that's not <laughs> shocking necessarily. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I do think if this was a story that played in six to nine panels and didn't, and wasn't so graphically compelling, I don't know that we'd ever be talking about it. With, right. Yeah. With much to say at all. The fact that Hickman puts together his first day, his first graphic novel, and it has all that. And like you said, there are rough edges, but generally it's pretty good. Um, and it is visually distinct. So even now, and you know, and like, I don't want to say, oh, no one's ever done it before or anything like that, because that tends to never be true. But not a lot of people write comics like this, right? And, yeah. and that part of it stands out. Um, and that I appreciate about it. That I appreciate about it. And I doubt, I would still recommend it, certainly, as a, if you're a fan of Hickman, if you're a fan of the medium and kind of how he uses it, I think it's a compelling read. Purely on a story level, I don't think I'd recommend it. Yeah, I'm, I'm right there with you. It's it's interesting and sort of in the context of the arc of his work, like, uh, and him as a creator. It's 
without question, not a book I would pick up and hand to someone who has little to no familiarity with Jonathan Hickman. Like, I, yeah, I don't yeah. think there'd be, um, there'd be great returns there. Um, but yeah, like you were saying, I think it, like, if you take it at the right age, if you'd read it at a certain age and, and during the time it was published when, um, it, it seemed like the things happening in this book or probably at that time were impossible, could, couldn't happen in this country, would it mm-hmm. would never happen. Mm-hmm. And in that context, it seems more of like sort of an, an absurdist, uh, kind of anger fantasy in a way, whereas re- reading it now in, in, in this context, uh, it just feels a little too real, like, and, and too possible, um, which I don't know. I don't think it's aged. The, the way the ideas are conveyed hasn't, hasn't aged super well. I mean, I guess just to, to put a point on it too, it's just like, I am opposed to violence against journalists. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. That, without question. Very I mean, clear. That's, that's my day job. So it's like, I <laughs> certainly don't support doing that. Yeah. Yeah. And like that piece of it, there's sort of a, the way Hickman's writing it, there's sort of like a nudge, nudge, wink, wink, like, oh, yeah, we all want to do this, don't we? And I'm like, no, <laughs> like, I don't yeah. really. You know, yeah. like, that's not especially funny to me. Um, so that piece of it, I'm I'm the most skittish about for sure. Uh, but again, it's not it's not literally a manifesto. Again, even if it can be interpreted that way, I just don't think that's the authorial intent, which, again, I keep reading into it and I don't mean to be. But, like, no. you know, and it's, I, it's hard with this not to, I suppose. I, I'd be curious to. I'd be really curious actually to hear his thoughts about, about this book and the ideas in there and like sort of, cause, cause at now, the time I yeah. feel like he'd probably like, is it working in advertising or whatever his employment background was, was far more limited than it is now. Like he's almost 50 years old and has also made some compromises with his, like he was developing shows with Amazon. So if there's like yeah, there's yeah. some ideas here and there about like the individuals are complicit with the corporations they work for this was before he'd worked with Amazon and Disney and like these other, you know, he's, he's now had more experience with large media conglomerates. Whereas I think when he wrote this, he was mostly on the outside. So it'd be really, uh, I'd be really interested to kind of hear his take on this work and how it's aged and what he thinks about it now. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think too, like, you know, just looking at his work from this point forward, um, this is kind of the only thing that has this level of, you know, kind of like a young person's punk rock, you know, screw everything, you know, that kind of, that kind of nihilism (laughs) isn't, I mean, some of his works can be nihilistic, but in, but in pretty different ways than this, uh, I don't think a lot of, a lot else of his repertoire really has the same tone, uh, or the same anger. No, I was kind of surprised that he was 33 when he wrote this. Like I would like when I was first reading, I was kind of clocking it as like, oh, this is a guy in his early 20s, early yeah, mid yeah. 20s, like super mad. But right. I, it was maybe ideas he'd been he'd been kicking around. But you're right. Like it doesn't. The, I think there there may be like Black Monday Murders, for example, uh, was probably the creator owned work I was thinking of most when I was reading this, because I think it deals in some of the same themes and territories. Yeah. But the but the anger has sort of been traded for this like. I, almost like this creepy sense of like foreboding horror. Like he's kind of yeah. toned down the anger and up the, up the just like fear. And I think it's, it's just kind of the sign of like uh, a more experienced storyteller, like the kind of like evoke similar emotions without being so direct about them. Um, yeah. Kind of shows how far he's come with kind of working in the same, largely the same space, like this idea about profiteering and these giant uh, monolithic structures that we're up against kind of appear in both books. Yeah, no, for sure. I think that is the the spiritual sequel. I think if you know, and I think both of us are coming down um, relatively hard on the nightly news. You know, I think if you're here for the chronological read through of Hickman's work for the first time, especially like I, I want to be clear, like I think it's a really interesting comic. Um, the first time I read it, I did not have the same level of reservation that I do now, certainly. Um, but I think your point, Zach, about Black Money Mirrors being a spiritual sequel, and in my view, being a much better one, um, as he's again just it's that thing of like, yeah, he's he's been writing comics for ten years at that point. He's got so many reps under his belt. Um, where that comic, I think, I think does what he's trying to do here, but does it a lot better and in more interesting ways. Um, I think you're spot on there. I think you know other media that I think you know could could capture similar themes and, and similar vibes successfully. Um, the, you know, we might have mentioned Fight Club a hundred times, but like Mr. Robot, I think especially like the first season. Um, of of that USA series with Rami Malek and uh, it's directed by Sam Ishmael. Like that taps into a lot of 
the way information spreads and sort of the invisible hand of wealth in, in which isn't so invisible when you actually get to the people corrupted by that power you know spreading it um i think uh even something like succession i was thinking know, a lot about succession i was reading yeah because yeah. so like and that's a piece we haven't talked about plot wise is like there are these players in politics there are these players um, that actually own these news organizations who have all the money and have all this power and for them it's all it's moving it's it's influencing the masses for the purposes of continuing to control them and continuing to increase their bottom line right and and in succession that is so much what we're dealing with right this family that you know their wealth is is predicated on you know feeding this the news machine right they're they're news people um and obviously it does a lot more than that but i, I think that's definitely a, a relevant show to go to if you haven't checked that out before for for themes here yeah and they're totally amoral about it like there's a scene where the uh one of the sons calls the father out on like oh you're you're profiting off of all this this venom and hatred and he says oh you just noticed now like mm -hmm. <laughs> they're entirely that's our business model basically <laughs> like, mm -hmm. so. yeah yeah absolutely so Pardon me. Um, yeah, I, I definitely recommend going through the chronological journey, uh, checking this out, figuring out, you know, kind of the the styles and and the design elements of what Hickman's doing here. Um, but, you know, I guess, you know, do do be forewarned that the nightly news it came out in 2006 um, and and it reads like it. And it's not, you know, and even just to to, you know, we should have mentioned this earlier, but just to like the framing, the sort of media setting that Hickman's working in is. Uh, Iraq war three years in, right? And the growing awareness of being lied to by the government, right? So so lack of faith in yeah. institutions, right? About weapons of mass destruction. You have a lot of scandals that Hickman's referencing here at institutions like the New York Times, having reporters who were outed for fictionalizing stories, right? Basically just taking the easiest, but the least ethically sound <laughs> journalism path of, I'm just going to make up sources because right. it's easier yeah. than actually going out and finding people who have quotes I want to say, right? So you have a number of, of things like that. Um, and then in media, you know, this is a very, it, when I think about 2006, I primarily am thinking about music because that's, that's the media I would have been consuming the most heavily. And I'm thinking about stuff like Green Day's American Idiot. I'm thinking about like the thermals, the body blood, the machine. Like it's a good time for punk rock albums um, to be, sort of protesting and just raging against where we are in America at this time. Um, and Hickman's doing the same thing, right? Like this is his, this is his punk rock album. This is him saying the news is corrupt and, and the way information is spread is a disaster. Also, we as a country are susceptible to cult like ideologies here, literalized in the cult of the voice. And I'm mad as hell about that. And I'm not going to take it anymore. Right. And right. That, yeah, that's yeah. what this book is. Yeah, I think it's I think it's pretty well in line with the zeitgeist of that time. Like there was just this prevailing sentiment like, we're you know, we're being screwed by power structures and there's nothing we can do about it. And yeah. we're mad. Like I think 2000, like getting back to the music, 2007 was like Rage Against the Machine reunion. Like it was mm. kind of the end of the Bush years. Like people yeah. were furious. And this book, I think, has grown right from a lot of conversation. And, and like it's definitely not at odds with the tone of the time. Yeah. And I would say that is the piece you know, I talk about the things that make me skittish. The piece that I connect to the most is what you just said, which is we are really getting screwed by power structures. And I think that piece definitely continues to play and will continue to play, you know, and but it's a thing where it's like awareness around that, ironically, usually uncovered by journalists, because I actually personally am of the opinion that like there is value in that watchdog system of of exposing what is happening, because otherwise it's all propaganda all the time. Um Hickman's really very cynical about that, I think, in this work, which is maybe one of the pieces where I lose lose him the most. Um, but yeah, no. So the nightly news, I mean, it's an interesting read. Uh, definitely 15 years later, it is it is very compelling. Um, it's fascinating from a comics career progression standpoint, but it's also like it is fascinating to sort of analyze in terms of like, OK, this was of the moment and what has changed since that moment that makes it more or less relevant, because um, in some ways it 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 works on both terms, right? There are some things that are more relevant. There are some things that are absolutely do not work. Um, you know, like you said way early on, especially just the rise of social media and the way information is conveyed. Um, Zach, any other additional notes or, or thoughts you want to add on the, on the night of the news here? No, I'm, I'm just glad we talked about the, uh, the self insert. Cause like, I didn't like when I, <laughs> the first <laughs> yeah. time I read this, I maybe didn't know what he looked like. Same, like yeah. So I, I was kind of reading this and I was like, 
that's him. Like, and like that guy is undeniably him. Like, yeah. like he's drawing himself in this comic. Like, <laughs> so I, I kind of got a kick out of that. Yeah, that was funny. Um, I, yeah. I read in one of the interviews, you know, he's saying basically he, for all of the characters, he had actual friends or family, like, like pose, like in photos. Right. So he was literally okay. taking photos of it. And he said like, by the time he got to the end of it, he was like sick of it. He was like, it would have been easier just to draw everybody, or yeah. just to draw people. Um, but it, he did a very photorealistic, like actual individuals posing. And then I think, I think the idea is like he would take that, Photoshop it, draw over it, kind of thing. So like, if it looks like it's kind of cut and paste, like images, like I think they're that's kind of literally part of the process. Um, so, but yeah, the the one being literally him. <laughs> is is pretty funny in retrospect also because like if you've seen him in interviews uh if you've listened to him over time like he's a pretty soft-spoken mild-mannered dude yeah totally <laughs> so like yeah. it's, it's pretty hard to envision him being a part of this cult certainly uh but yeah all right so that's the nightly news the next uh the next entry here is going to be hickman's second work which is pax romana which i will just tease i personally am a lot more favorable towards um i i think in terms of what that book does uh it gets away it really gets into the big world building sci-fi stuff that i like a lot from hickman um so that will be uh, a pretty fun one i'll just the the teaser for what that book is is it's a future where islam has taken over as the primary religion of the world and the catholic church uses time travel to go back and try to fight that <laughs> so it's it's not going to be less politically relevant right because of because of you know obviously it's heavy on religion um but it is very sci-fi in, in that regard uh, which i which i'm going to enjoy uh zach while we have you on hickmania what is your what are your favorite i guess jonathan hickman written works and like what do you i don't know kind of like where do you where do you stand with the creator 15 years down the line like what do you still think yeah, I mean, this 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 maybe didn't come across in our assessment of the nightly news, but I'm a huge fan. Like, yeah, right. So one of my favorite comic book creators. Uh, if I had to pick a favorite, it would be Black Monday Murders. Like, I mm -hmm. and like, it, like I just absolutely love that comic, and like that's probably um, the nicest thing I could say, or one of the nicest things to say about this one is I feel like we don't get Black Monday Murders without this book. Like, yeah, you know, directly connected. But yeah, that's that's my favorite Hickman. And, um, I mean, I've read all his work. Like I'm, I'm a huge fan. So don't, don't misread this. I just think like everyone's first yeah. comic is not their best comic. Like that, that's a, that's a saying you hear time and time again. And it's true. Yeah. Yeah. Right. No, it's, it's, it shouldn't be shocking, I suppose. You know, and I, I think too, again, when you look at the landscape of critical reception, this comic did really well. Um, it was Eisner was on, nominated. Yeah. Yeah. Got on, nominated for an Eisner for best limited series. Um, it was on a lot of lists of like best of the year. I mean, again, just the infusion of style and, and having a point, right. And having a purpose, like definitely give credit, Hickman credit there. We can, we can criticize maybe the execution. Um, but this is a comic with a purpose. <laughs> like it, it has a message to convey. It has literal facts to get across. And it, there was, I, I wondered with the infographics um, and obviously like, data can be manipulated and stuff like that um but these i wondered like what well, was hickman literally was he making stuff up as he went was he kind of blending fact and fiction and in interviews at least he says that that was his plan originally um but as he progressed like the data was too too good to pass up on so everything he pulled was sourced somewhere uh as intended as fact um so like the information he's sharing here is is based on truth as we know it, right? As it was conveyed by uh, by the corporate news media. Yeah, and it's got that full bibliography in the back. Like, so if you're interested in digging into uh, media commentary from 15 years ago, <laughs> you, you can do that. Yeah. Well, and that's you know a lot of with a lot of what I want to do on this. So like, I do want to dig into okay, what's like recommended reading and sort of like additional sources that that kind of add to the experience. With this one though, it is so heavily rooted in the era where I'm like, well, is reading a take on the, where the New York Times was at in 2004 that interesting to me? <laughs> you know? Yeah. And I don't I, know. I think the Chomsky books on there probably read better than some sure. of the more more specific ones. Than like some Because some of the things he cited were like, a report from that year on how journalists felt about their work. So yeah, which yeah. is super dated. Like but yeah, yeah, I think there's some like if you want to dig through some of that, there's probably a handful of books you can find uh with that have more overarching points to make about things. Sure, sure. Okay, cool. 
All right, good deal. So this has been the Nightly News number one. Again, next time we're going to talk about Pax Romana. Um, we'll have a new new guest on for that. Uh, but, you know, you can find all the the kind of the progression of what we're going to want to talk about here in the show notes and all that stuff. Uh, otherwise, you know, like, subscribe, share, whatever you're listening to um, here on Comic Book Herald. And we'll have more Hickmania coming down the line. Zach, uh, where can people find you and where should people look for your work? Yeah, follow me on Twitter at Comics Bookcase and on Instagram also at Comics Bookcase. Perfect. That, Zach, thanks for your time. And uh, everybody else, we'll, we'll see you next month.